Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from The Hague. I'm Tracy Sutton, and I'm the founder and the lead expert at Root. I'm really excited to be chairing this webcast to you today, which has been co-curated by myself, the KIDV team, and Be Wastewise. My role is to make sure that you come away from this session knowing how you can help us unlock more progress faster together. Whether you manage yourself, drive a team, or manage an entire business, I want you to feel inspired and to know what you can do when you next, next sit down at your desk. We've got a really unmissable program ahead for you today, including some polls, uh, some interviews, some consumer insights, and then it's going to end with the crescendo, which is our panel. We were really overwhelmed by the positive response to this session and would like to welcome over 500, I think closer to 550, uh, people who have registered for this event. We've also worked really hard to integrate the questions that you shared when you did register and are pleased to have content that you've helped create with, from over 40 countries, including the Maldives, Moscow, Malawi, Costa Rica, Colombia and Canada. A few practical things before we get started. We're going to be using Slido for the polls later on. So no matter how fast your Wi-Fi connection is, there's going to be a little bit of a delay between when you submit your response and then when we all see the results. This webcast is being recorded and will be available on the, way, the, K, the KIDV website very soon. Finally, we'd really like you to be tweeting and active on the social channels, so please use the hashtag PackForward and the other accounts that you'll be seeing on the screen um, at the moment for the KIDV, Root, and Be Wastewise. So I hope that you've now made yourselves comfortable. Maybe you have a dog, a cat, or even one of your children by your side. And because I'm British, hopefully you've either got a cup of tea or depending on what time of the day it is, where you are, um, maybe a beer in your hand. I'd like to start by adding some perspective from my 20 years that I've worked in the packaging industry. I studied sustainable product design quite a long time ago now, back in 1999, and then worked as a packaging technologist, packaging engineer, and then headed up the technical team at a global packaging design agency in London and New York. I then founded Root in 2013, where we believe in the urgency for change. Our role is to reduce the impact of every product and pack that we work on, and our packaging analysis and strategy work is being rolled out globally by big brands. I've experienced the full life cycle of packaging, from design, manufacture, use, and end of life. And it's this holistic perspective that I believe is absolutely crucial to help us solve some of the urgent environmental issues that we're facing today. While I'm really impressed by the amount of passion, expertise and talent that there will be from every single one of you dialing into this session, I'm also frustrated because I feel like we can make more progress. We need to think differently and we can do more faster together. Sustainable packaging is complex, so today we're going to be framing it under three key themes. Business, society and policy. We're also going to be asking some uncomfortable questions because the current way that we're the current way that we're using a very protective or protected polished approach to communication, collaboration and uh, and competition is not working. Up to a million people die every year as a result of mismanaged waste, and millions of people are affected around the world as a result of um, disease, drought, um, and air pollution as well. Innovative materials are not going to help us solve these problems. Recycling isn't going to solve resource scarcity. And reusable packaging and zero waste, well, a lot of it has got higher impacts if it isn't designed properly. We all need to make more progress faster together. And we'd like to know whether you want to be part of the problem or part of the solution. It's a great pleasure that I now hand over to the wonderful Chris Bruns, from, who is the general manager at the KIDV and the founding father of the book, The State of Sustainable Packaging. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Tracy, for introducing me. And it's so wonderful to have you here as a chair. Also, a warm welcome to all the viewers and uh, listeners on the, on the webcast. Uh, you are a very big amount, big, uh, many, many people are, are listening. Uh, I, I will short introduce uh, KIDV for those who don't know us. Um, we are 
a rather small uh, expert team with 16 experts. We are uh, based in The Hague in the Netherlands, and and we are let's say uh, our our goal is to help industry and uh, small and medium enterprises, but also big enterprises, uh, in their struggle in their in their uh, way to go to more sustainable packaging to to get more better results on that. Um, we are we are founded by the Dutch EPR system. Uh, everyone, every every company who is uh, putting more than 50,000 kilograms of packaged material on the market has to pay for the waste treatment and the collection. And a part of that income is also used to develop knowledge for the industry to uh, to improve their packaging choices. And therefore, we have a committee of independent experts, and we have a supervisory board of, let's say, industry uh, uh, ex re 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 representatives. So in the next slide, you will see uh, how we look at uh, the, uh, the, the market, in, in fact, the value chain. Our uh, um, main, main uh, target group are producers and importers of, uh, say, packaged materials and uh, um, packaging products. So you can, uh, for example, supermarkets, uh, retailers, and other, other branch type like um, uh, companies. And they are, let's say, positioned in two ways. On the one hand, they are positioned in the resources and the, 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 the availability of, let's say, sustainable materials. On the other hand, they are positioned into the consumer and to, let's say, the municipalities collecting waste and, and making it possible to get a good recycling input. And therefore, they are, let's say, tweaked or let's say they are positioned in between two uh, uh, forces in which they have to operate and to fulfill their, their, their needs and their, their uh, uh, ambitions, which is very complicated. So KADV helps them, supports them by, let's say, what we do, how we do it. Uh, well, we'll, we'll develop several tools for them to, to check whether their products are recyclable or not in terms of recycle uh, checks. Uh, we offer consultancy on, uh, in, in company, so we go into the company, ask them to put on the table all the package materials and the packaging they have, and talk about it and get results. And it's a very effective way of, let's say, giving the first uh, low-hanging fruit solutions. And uh, we are also helping to set uh, the goals and to, and to, uh, to achieve that. Merely also uh, with uh, the branch organizations, for example, the branch organizations of the supermarkets, which have, of course, a, a big, big task to, to fulfill the, the obligations they have uh, assigned for. So that's that's how we do it, and um, uh, we want to expand our to uh, to uh, uh, extend our work inter internationally. Uh, therefore, we have uh, introduced the the the, uh, the initiative called Pack Forward. Uh, you can look at the website packforward.eu. Do that after the webcast because there's time enough to look at the web the website after that. And this is an, uh, an uh, uh, um, this is uh, done by Valipak, Fosplus, and Grunpunk Nord. So the the Belgians and the Norwegians and the Dutch have started this initiative, and it's uh, it's the aim of today to get more people and more organizations involved internationally to, let's say, go into depth with industry and with knowledge institutes and with uh, consumers, with NGOs, and of course with policymakers to track, to, let's say, what we call intrinsically sustainable solutions. That's how we have, that's where we're heading for. So uh, to, give us, to give a short idea what we're looking at, um, uh, we have made a video. You might have seen it already, let's say, uh, in, in the in invitation. But of course, it is uh, no harm to look at it once more, one more time because I think it gives a brief uh, 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 view on how we look at, say, sustainable packaging in the future. So let's start a the video then. Packaging is everywhere. The KIDV currently launched the State of Sustainable Packaging this publication elaborates the functions, developments, and problems of packaging and explores on how we effectively can improve the quantity and quality of recycling and work towards a circular economy and intrinsically sustainable solutions. We simply cannot continue using current packaging methods, but we cannot abandon all packaging either. In order to pack forward, we need a three-fold innovation strategy 
the first track of this strategy is already set in motion and running full speed in leading countries. It involves improvements to waste collection, sorting and recycling systems, as well as improvements to packaging design and efficient use of materials. The second track is about how to realize circularity as much as possible instead of closing loops merely by recycling waste. For example, increasing the level of recycled materials used in new packaging and products, or implementing efficiency principles such as reuse, repair, and refurbish. Since we will not be able to close the material loop for the full 100%, we need a third track in which the material streams must become biosphere compatible and non-polluting. A clear one-way solution and approach won't happen overnight, but will influence the way we produce and consume. Promising examples already taking place towards realizing this crucial and challenging step are packaging made of potato peelings and paper fibers, a capsule of shampoo in a reusable bottle instead of single-use bottles, and laser branding of organic fruits and vegetables instead of using plastic packaging. Packaging is an integral part of our future. We can't live with it, and we can't go without it. Therefore, together, we should make it intrinsically sustainable. Fantastic, what a great video. Thanks for that introduction, Chris. It's my pleasure. Uh, and maybe you'd like to just show to the camera the, uh, the fantastic book as well, it's book, Sustainable it's, uh, Packaging. It's that become a little bit thicker than we thought because... There's uh, a lot of insight in that book. Um, yeah. And people can have a look on the screen now if they want to have a look at the link where they can download the book as well. Yes, and I have a special offer after the webcast, so please stay, uh, stay, stay with us because I have a special offer for you. Everybody well, likes an offer. That's well, nice. we, we made this book because we, 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 uh, we thought, well, everybody is busy with sustainable packaging. I mean, everybody in terms of uh, the industry and, and, and institutes I mentioned, but um, merely they are thinking about the problems of tomorrow and hardly about the problems after tomorrow or even further on. So Absolutely. the long-term vision of what, what is the long-term strategy, where should we go, where should we end, is uh, not always uh, there in the, in, the, in the mindsets, in the heads of, let's say, for example, CEOs. Absolutely, yeah. And I will be, uh, I'll be picking your brains about that shortly, Chris, as well. Yes. So uh, I look forward to that. Um, yeah. It also looks as though the KIDV are doing some fantastic work in terms of working with big brands and obviously retailers. Um, and a lot of the big brands that you're working with are very much leading the way in sustainability. So that's really good. Uh, we're now joined by Roland Tenklooster, who is the Professor of Packaging Design and Management at the University of Twente. Um, Roland was a significant contributor to the book for us. Oh, sorry, contributor to the book. Um, Roland is going to help uh, define some of the key packaging dilemmas for us today. Um, but just before we do that, what I'd like to do is ask Chris a little bit more about the context for the book and why it was commissioned. Chris, um, yeah. I think in, in, in my role and my experience I've seen over the years, there's been a lot, especially in the last sort of five years, a lot of different academic reports, NGO um, publications, um, other sort of industry reports, potentially from suppliers, etc. cetera. Um, why was it that you felt that you needed to commission something new? Was there something that we weren't doing very well, something that was missing? Well, uh, we do a lot, and of course, we use a lot of existing knowledge from the institutes you mentioned. We are, there are a, a, a bunch of reports and investigations already available. If you look at our library, it's full of publications. Um, but that's the, the danger of that, or the risk of that, is that um, we might uh, get into a groove, into a track, in which we don't know if we are going to the right direction. Every now and then, you have to lean back, backward and say, well, what are we, what are we doing? What are we really uh, exploring and in, in, in innovate? And it's maybe because of this COVID-19 period that I thought that, well, is it really sustainable what we are doing? And that's the main question I would put on the table today. Is a crowded world where we live in? And I'm not only looking at the Netherlands, but if we look at other countries in Europe or even beyond Europe, uh, you might see that, let's say, the, the infrastructure to treat waste, to get more, let's say, uh, new resources for new products, we have a long way to go. Mm. And the one, one of the one words I will introduce uh, in, this, in this debate is the biosphere compatibility of our materials. 
Yeah, and I think that for me, in terms of people and planet, the biosphere compatible aspect is often missing from other uh, approaches. Well, arguably, is less clear from, in my opinion, in things. We've got obviously the waste hierarchy and we've got the circular economy as well. Yes. I think what's interesting for me is this, this idea around uh, intrinsic sustainability, which is really looking at um, a lot of other deeper things over and above recycling and circularity, which are maybe some, some things, obviously we'll tap into that a little bit later. Yeah. One thing for me that I noticed with, from the book um, that stood out was that you had a lot of independent people uh, contributing to the book, um, as well as obviously the, the academic authors that were involved. Was the independent perspective really important for you over and above some other publications that might have a lot of supplier sponsorship yeah. or content? Yeah, well, independency is a, is a, is a rather discussable word. We are not really independent independent as such as KIDV is paid by the industry. Some people say, well, because you are paid by the industry, you might also uh, uh, take your position on, the, on their side. Well, we, we, we rather uh, want to talk about facts and figures. So the facts and figures tell us what to do. And uh, therefore, you might call it independency, but I think it's uh, more transparency. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, well, we had many comments from industry parties on this book in the draft versions, and, and they have, uh, it was a surprise for me that they merely agreed upon, let's say, the threefold strategies mm -hmm. we have explored there. So uh, I feel very convinced that we're on the right track now. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So what I'd like to do now, I might come back to you back on, in, in that in a minute, Chris, but um, I'd like to uh, ask the wonderful Roland here, um, the industry, we obviously face some big dilemmas. Um, and I talked earlier around the fact that we want to make more progress faster together. There's a huge amount of experience in the industry. Packaging design is your forte, your background. Um, it's a complicated process. We've got lots of people working in lots of silos. Um, and I think that you're going to give us a little bit of an overview of some of those key dilemmas that we're facing. Um, maybe you're going to start with a, a bit of information around um, sort of some trends that we're seeing in terms of the use of materials and packaging on the market at the moment. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Packaging design, fantastic field in my opinion, because when I explain to students always, actually we are going from marketing to production lines and everything is in between. So you go from appearance and, and DNA of brands uh, up to high efficiency, high speed running packaging lines actually. And it's hard to start if you want to give an overview. So there are, there are two slides now which, which shows you well, a, a huge amount of waste being produced per, per capita and it's uh, per capita so it's actually rather stable, it's, uh, growing a little bit, but uh, we have a growing population on one side. And on the other side, we see more or less a stabilized use of types of materials, so cotton, both glass, metal, and, and actually you, you, maybe you could even talk about locked-ins, you know, because uh, some people uh, think that you really can change fast, but it's impossible with the capacity and, and the efficiency that we have to deal uh, uh, with uh, nowadays. And um, when you look to the plastics, and that's the next slide, you can see that uh, this, this brought us actually the focus on, on one of the, the issues which we have to deal with uh, today, as you know. And, and most of the discussions are about uh, uh, not being recycled, about plastic soup, about microfibers, etc. If we see what we produce and, and we compare with what we recycle, this is a big issue. But if we go to the next slide, and this is for me a very um, important one because it shows a lot of things, and actually when I have to explain packaging design to students, it's, 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 for me it's multi-criteria decision making, and there are so many things you have to put in, and many people often forget where we came from. And I, I can imagine if you're born after the 90s, and in the 90s, one of the biggest methods of packaging, which is used nowadays, which is uh, modified atmosphere packaging, so you fill the packaging with nitrogen, carbon dioxide, sometimes a little bit oxygen, to keep the product as uh, fresh as long as possible, that you hardly can imagine what it was 20 years before that, that you had to grow your vegetables, you had to preserve them, it was only in cans and glass jars, and fresh all over the years was not possible. So what you see is, on, on the functionality on the top, that um, what the industry has been doing is working on all these functions of packaging, working on barriers, on new methods, higher quality, 
uh, higher levels of hygiene. I have seen graphs from the United Nations where the stomach illnesses really went down because of proper packaging, for example. And all these things we seem to forget by uh, by coming back to, of, are coming in with solutions, and in my opinion, I think, hey, I had a scene before, this was a packaging we had in the 60s or something, or we had in the 70s, or this material or whatever. So there is a big story behind it. So, so we started on functionality, really, in terms of yeah, product protection. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, one of the main focus issues of industry is, is cost. Cost is always a big driver because you want to be cheaper than your competitor. So also efficiency. And um, actually, you could even see, if, if you look to the strategies with all the R's, reuse and recycle, et cetera, that uh, the lowest carbon footprint is most of the packaging materials that we have now on the market. And this is a big discussion because going back to plastics, we see that they are not recyclable. And then going to circular, we, have, we are faced with, certainly we are faced with all kinds of issues. Mm. But this functionality is very strong on packaging, it's still growing. Because nowadays packaging can decolorize if they are not cold enough or they can tell you messages and active and intelligent packaging comes in. So it's, it's growing and growing. On the other side, we have marketing and design consideration. And this is about branding and about reaching the consumer. If, if you walk into the supermarket, you have so much choice. And the packaging is shouting to you, see me and then take me and use me. And that's, that's um, uh, what designers are working on all the time. So as soon, it's always fantastic to see, as soon as a printer comes in with a new technique to, to introduce a pearlish effect or do something with metalized or with gloss, you see it growing into the market really fast because everyone wants to use it. And, and interestingly, if, if, we, if we started looking at packaging in terms of the functionality challenges or, or, or into the product protection, we've also got the marketing and the design considerations and then the environment as well. It feels like we've gone from a journey starting at functionality and product protection embedding and then in, in growing the marketing design considerations and then we've got the environmental side of things which is really trailing behind and, and I think my experience, I don't know about yourself, is that those teams aren't talking enough to each other. No, or the, They don't have enough yeah. cr kind of uh, cross-sector expertise, essentially, especially in the design sector, I think, which yeah. um, definitely in the UK and in other uh, areas of Europe, I've noticed that Many people coming into packaging design, um, you've either got packaging designers who are either structural or industrial design or graphic designers. They do not have the, the, the skill sets, which is something I want to pick up on later. Well, what's your thoughts around where we need to get to in terms of the environmental considerations and those kind of challenges? Because that's arguably one of the hardest parts for us to crack. That's absolutely the hardest part, and that, that's absolutely what we can see, that uh, we did some research after how decisions are being taken in the field of packaging design, and actually, mostly you see that the marketeer takes a decision of the, which material has to be chosen. <laughs> and this is just uh, not what we call intrinsically designing packaging. Or so what gives you a great story for yeah. short term. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, you can actually see it at the moment. We see so many coated paper types coming in, uh, all because they have a certain uh, a perceived sustainability. They look sustainable, but if we analyze them and we see the coatings on it, all the plastics, and uh, a, lot, a lot of them are water-based emulsions, so they're causing micro, uh, microfibers very fast if you put them in nature or whatever. Mm. And they are sold as being 100% paper. You see that the perceived, uh, the achieved su sustainability is absolutely not there. Mm. So meaning that these fields all have to talk to each other much more to take proper decisions. Mm. And then, of course, uh, as, as the, the picture showed, we can, we can do actually a lot on recyclability to improve many materials, to make them better recyclable. Um, rigid and semi-rigid plastics, I think we can come really, really far. The flexibles is more difficult, especially the, the printed ones. So we have to come up with solutions for them. Still, we think we can reach more than what we do now, but of course barriers and the quality of the product is really important. We don't want to, don't want to throw away uh, the food product because then, of course, the, the effect is much larger than just this, this small piece of packaging material. And what's your, 
what's your thoughts on the... So a lot of the conversation generally is starting to kind of tap into the book and the three tracks. A lot of the conversation tends to be about recyclability. So yeah. my view is that, you know, if you're, if you're you know, realistically putting a product on, product on the market that doesn't have recyclable packaging, and if it can have recyclable content in it, it should have. That's kind of baseline what you should be doing. We've also got things like carbon emissions, but what's your perspective on... Um, designers, whether we're talking about or um, whether it's packaging development teams, their understanding of carbon versus where we think we are on recycling, because they're, they're both really important. They're absolutely important and, and what you see is that your understanding is, is mostly not at the level that we actually need to, to reach the targets finally. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true and that, that's a difficult one because um, I think we it's not that you uh, it looks like people are waiting for some kind of innovation which will bring them the solution. Mm. No, that's not it. I mean, we have to uh, improve recyclability. We have to go for more circular. And then circular is now being translated, as you state, to being recyclable. And then mostly focus on, on plastics. But on the other side, I mean, paper contains a lot of chemicals. Glass is not fully being recycled. It's being collected and metals, uh, uh, metal cans are not rec uh, recyclable back to metal cans, but to metal products. So We have the coating on the inside of the metal cans. As yeah, well. we have coatings and we have leggers and we have much more. So, And we have many alloys, many different alloys and, and, and stuff like that. So it's much more than just that. And the focus is, uh, uh, I mean, Ellen MacArthur uh, report, which is uh, some kind of fundament nowadays as well. Uh, I think they, they really tell us we have to develop new materials as well. Many people think we have, we have to solve everything with the current materials. I think many of the current materials are not able to solve it. Mm -hmm. We have to go steps further. And also think about systems as well. So a lot of the packs that I've always talked about, the idea that we need to redesign new packs and systems that reflect the environmental and societal Absolutely. needs of today. We're, we're, we're yeah. kind of trying to retrofit, yeah. you know, pack, pieces, types of packaging that, are, that have never been designed to be recycled, to be economically viable, to be recycled, especially on a global basis, which is, you know, the amount of time and money investment that's yeah. going in there. I, I often use uh, also to explain in many lectures that many, t many people talk about sustainable packaging, but I mean, packaging is not an identity which has existence on its own. It needs a product to exist. It's a serving identity, actually. And, and uh, actually, if you talk about a sustainable product chain, then you see it from a different perspective. And then you can ask yourself, hey, in what part of this chain do I need a package or some extra protection or something to distribute it? And then what is the best solution? Absolutely. Is it, is it a one-way solution? Do I have to recycle it? Do I have to reuse it? And then at what level? And I think we have to, we can make some kind of scales all around. And then uh, looking at those scales, you could say, well, this fits in that one and partly in that one, and maybe find all kinds of, of uh, hybrid solutions for that. Okay. Uh, can I add a, add a question to it, Roland? Of course, please yeah, do, Chris. Uh, yeah, this well, is yours. What, what do you think about, when, in, in the situation where we are now, is it, is it uh, in, in your opinion, also uh, caused by the demand of the consumer or the, the society in, in terms of, is it, a, is it a fulfillment of our wishes or is it a, a, a push market over, overcoming us and say, well, the tomatoes are in plastic, so we have to accept the plastic or we have to accept the paper or we have to accept the glass. So are they, let's say, uh, involved in the innovations or are they victims of the innovations, if you put it like that? You know, it's I, think both, I think both ways. The, the problem is that what we know this and we did research after the effect of the appearance of packaging design on choice behavior. That is so easy to influence consumers because most of the choices are based are made rather unconscious. Mm. And um, I recommend many students to read the book uh, of uh, Daniel Kahneman, where the, 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 the psychologist who won the Nobel Prize of Economy, because he is actually showing how we choose and what affects us. And that's not what very racing. What are you talking about there, sorry? Uh, f uh, thinking fast, fast and, and slow. slow. Sorry, yeah, time, thinking yeah. fast and slow. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely, read that for everybody. It's, it's boring to read uh, research after research, but the message is so fantastic. So the book has two sides, but no, it's absolutely. The problem is in the shop. Um, people just choose, and back home they start thinking. And what I do is I weigh all the packaging that I buy and I compare them, and then suddenly you you are really astonished. Nowadays you get 
paper bags for free because plastic is not allowed. But I have paper bags which have a plastic handle of six grams of plastic. Well, a normal, uh, uh, a very simple plastic bag weighs nine grams. So all, 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 only the handles are almost this heavy as the previous bag. So what the hell are we doing? And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm conscious of time because I know that we need to talk about the pack forward movement, but I'm glad to know it's not only myself that spends a lot of my free time weighing packaging. Um, <laughs> especially I find it really interesting um, weighing beauty and skincare packaging when often the weight of the packaging and the volume of yeah. the product. Yeah, the ratio is really important. It's, it's yeah. a little bit crazy, yeah, isn't it? Um, Chris, uh, I really would love to hear more about the Pack Forward movement. Um, forward. Yes. Can you start by letting us know what your ambition is? Well, the ambition is that, uh, well, well, the reason why we start Pack Forward is that uh, we have to, 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 to dive into the, the complexity of what the Mr. Van Kloster, the Roland Van Kloster, has explained. So, um, we see a lot of, let's say, pledges and ambitions and plastic pacts and hand uh, writings and, and, and commitments. And, um, but when you want to fulfill those commitments as an industry, as a, as a, as a party, and not only talking about Coca-Cola or, or Unilever or the big ones, but also the smaller ones, um, it's hard to find your way. So we need to uh, to, to explore and to, to set up a more surface level, higher surface level in Europe, for example, to, um, to, 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 to help these people out. So the, the Pack Forward movement, I'm glad you, you call it as a movement because mm. it's not, not, not a platform or a website. It's really uh, uh, aimed to be, let's say, uh, uh, a bunch of people from everywhere, you can you can join back forward if you think you can contribute something. So not just individuals. Um, yeah. You, you're looking for businesses, individuals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you're uh, you're you're uh, are 80 years old, you don't have a job anymore, but you have good ideas. Inclusivity is really yeah, important. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. We, we Absolutely. Don't discriminate on age, so we, everybody can can be there. And uh, uh, well, we want to we want to set up actions and share knowledge together to get, let's say, more uh, understanding uh, between parties in, on the international scale and also prevent from, let's say, pre prevent people from doing the same kind of research which is already done in another country. And, and also I think that there's a, there's a bit of an argument I've heard some people who are members of some of the um, different organisations or packs that exist at, at the moment and I think it depends how much you get out of it. Some people, depending on your motivation personally, you're, you either kind of turn up for the cheese and pickle sandwiches, or you turn up to really give and get involved. And I wonder, part of that, I think, is kind of personal values. But yeah. also, I think that, is there an opportunity for Pack Forward to go? How can it really sort of shape the way to, to, to kind of bring together those values and go one step further than some of the other sort of many industry collaborations that exist? Well, um, I think I think we, we uh, should uh, uh, do a lot on, on translation and, 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 and um, making, let's say, uh, tools or, or uh, practical services uh, for uh, industry to, to be used. And like, like we are currently working, of course, we know that there's, 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 there's a lot of uh, uh, energy in, in, in guidelines, for example. Mm. But the guidelines are not applicable everywhere in the same way so yeah, we, we've kind of got we've got guidelines overload at the moment i think haven't we yeah and and it's, it's even a competition which guidelines you might choose for your future decision so i think that's not the right the right track i think we should try to harmonize as much as possible because industry and uh, i think in the next debate we will hear that also industry likes to have let's say a harmonized way of acting to the future and we need to keep language simple as well, I think, which yes, is one of the really important things. Yeah. So maybe potentially somewhere where the competition comes slightly down on the agenda, collaboration yeah. comes up, where we're being more transparent and, and honest, yeah. and where we're speaking a language that a broader audience can understand rather than the technical or the science, for example. Yes, when we talk about societal innovation, which I'll come to that later, that, is, that will say that, that we, if we want to incorporate all the parties in the society, you, you have to, to uh, make your own language again. To, un to make it understandable. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Thank you very much, Roland, and thanks yourself, Chris, for, for outlining that for us. Um, I think that we are 
Well, I think that some of the key things really is that we've that we're all facing lots of really really big challenges. It's a really complicated environment. Um, the pack forward experience. I hope that everybody's really starting to get excited about. I certainly am. Um, I'm now going to leave you in the very capable hands of the very wonderful Marjorie Knapp, who is the communications advisor at the KIDV. Um, Marjorie's going to walk you through some fantastic polls that we've got ready for you. Um, it's going to be a really quick and easy way that you can give your opinion and also look at what the other global in, uh, input is going to be from um, other attendees. Uh, so we've got the consumer insights and the polls coming up for you now. So thank you, Tracy. And as Tracy already mentioned, I'm now going to walk you through a few polls. So you can enter the polls where you go to uh, slido.com and you can enter the password which is shown now in the screen. Um, so yeah, we can now go to the first question um, because we would love to know your thoughts on this. So the first question is, who do you think needs to do more for the transition towards sustainable packaging? And we already... Um, put a few options in place, but you can only choose one. So I'm really curious um, what you enter now. And um, as Tracy also mentioned before, there's a, a short delay in when I receive, I will see the answers and you clicked it. But um, we now see it already moving. So most of you now vote for uh, brand owners, 50%. Um, and as you can see, no one has voted for research and knowledge institutes yet, which is quite, yeah, quite a nice result. Um, so I think brand owners is still on top. All right, there are a couple of more votes coming in. <laughs> But I think we have a winner. I think brand owners is what you all think uh, is, is the, the one who should do more for the transition towards sustainable packaging. So I would now uh, like to go to the next question because we have many questions that we want your opinion of. Um, so this is an open question actually, so you can just um, type whatever you want. The question is, what should the Pack Forward movement do that other initiatives haven't succeeded in? So of course, Chris, in the part before this, Chris already described um, what Pack Forward is and what we want to do with it, but we would also like your opinion on it. Um, so please let us know by typing your answer. I can already see European alignment, profiling, Transparency, um, hold brand owners accountable, give pragmatic solutions that can be implemented tomorrow. I think that's also one of our goals with Pack Forward, so it's good that you mentioned this. Um, we also see influence marketing managers, transparency. Yeah, so some really interesting answers coming through. Holds brand owners accountable is also one that's now coming into the screen. And of course, we will also share these answers uh, with you um, after the webcast. We now also see genuine value chain cooperation, which I think is also one of the goals of Pack Forward. So we would definitely work on that as well. So I think concerning the time, we can now also go to the next question. Uh, the next question is, uh, what do you feel the main barrier is in the transition towards reusable packaging? And this is also a closed answer, so you can also uh, pick one of the answers that suits best in your opinion. Let's see. Um, so we have, you can choose either convenience, high costs, limited infrastructure, hygiene, public image, or limited choice. And high cost is now, now has the most percentage. But convenience is following up 
quickly. It's good to see that a lot of you are voting back, uh, back home. <laughs> nice to have some engagement in the webcast as well. <laughs> so high cost is still number one. Uh, followed quickly by limited infrastructure and convenience as well. So everyone is still voting, but I now suggest to go uh, to the next question and convenience is now on the top, <laughs> but it was a close call. Um, so the last question, question is, how should the EU government influence sustainable packaging? So it's now open for votes. It's also a closed question. And actually, um, just before the panel discussion, Tracy will go through the answers because we also want to use your inputs in these polls um, in the further progress of the webcast and in the panel discussion in particular. So if you can all vote now, then we can return to this question before the panel discussion. And then um, we will now quickly go, um, as Tracy already mentioned, uh, to the consumer perspective, because of course this is also a perspective that we shouldn't forget when we talk about sustainable packaging. So actually we as K KRDV, we went on the streets and we interviewed a couple of um, consumers and we asked them what their perspective is around sustainable packaging. So uh, yeah, we can now go to the video. You will see it now. Ik zou zeggen de glazen pot. Een glazen pot, ja. Dus als ik bijvoorbeeld een soep moet uh, kiezen, dan zou ik dat eerder in een glas uh, okay. kopen. Blik, blik. Je kan ja, je recyclen, toch? heel makkelijk. Ik denk dat dat plastic met dat aluminium vervulde dingetjes het minst duurzaam is. Mijn eerste indruk was glas, maar je kunt het natuurlijk allemaal hergebruiken. Het kan allemaal. Als iets uh, ja, exorbitant is ingepakt, dan uh, laat ik het vaak wel liggen. Als ik bijvoorbeeld echt iets nodig heb van wat dan alleen maar in plastic bijvoorbeeld te verkrijgen is, dan ga ik het wel gewoon halen, maar liever niet. Ik irriteer me wel aan dat de appels dan niet gewoon in een uh, papieren zakje zitten, maar dat het dan weer anders zo verpakt is. Neem nou koekjesverpakking, zit een kartonnen doos omheen en dan zit het weer in plastic. Na nou, mijn idee kan dat minder. Bijvoorbeeld waar ik in de buurt woon, daar heb je gewoon een glasbak, daar heb je, heb je gewoon restafval, je hebt papier. Dus ik ga ook vanuit dat ze hem recyclen. Ik denk dat het meest op een vuilnisbelt gestort wordt, dat er eigenlijk niet meer echt naar omgekeken wordt of het wordt verbrand. Dat, dat denk ik. Dat vind ik altijd zo spannend. Ja, hè? Dat, dat... Ik geloof ze namelijk niet altijd dat ze het echt duurzaam doen, dat ze echt het scheiden enzovoort. Dat is wel, heb ik begrepen van het nieuws, dat alles wat ook uh, gescheiden werd van elkaar, dat ook in één grote brand in terecht kwam. Ik denk onze regering is daar verantwoordelijk voor. Die kan daar denk ik boven op leggen dat de, 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 de grote industrie die dat voor zorgt dat het minder verpakkingen gaat uh, verbruikt gaat worden. Okay. Ik denk iedereen in Nederland, iedereen moet gewoon zijn steentje bijdragen. Ja, wij als consumenten. Ik denk dat de producenten daar, het zou misschien niet zo moeten zijn, maar die hebben daar denk ik wel een, uh, een leidende rol in om ervoor te kunnen zorgen dat dat zo gebeurt. Ik denk educatie en bus zijn het allerbelangrijkste. Want als dat er is... Dan gaan mensen automatisch, ja, dan, ik ga vanuit dat mensen automatisch dan minder afval zullen produceren. Minder vraag, minder aanbod. Wow, uh, I knew I was going to find this really interesting. I was going to reflect on those both for a minute actually. I think that the street talk videos um, were really interesting in the fact that uh, a couple of really key things I picked out was that it happened to be when we asked the question around whose responsibility it was, often the industry tend to sort of point the finger at the consumer and say that we're, 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 meeting, uh, we're, we're, do, we're meeting consumer demand. What I found really interesting was it, it was the younger lady who actually mentioned that it was everybody that needs to take responsibility. And I think that that's a really um, contemporary, modern approach to things. Uh, other key takeaways really are the, the, the question where we were looking at which was the highest impact uh, packaging. 
We've had a lot of conversations quite on the last sort of six to 12 months, really, with a number of packaging um, businesses and, and brands as well, where they're a little bit nervous about glass, um, but also metal, because we're starting to recognise, um, which is, I kind of saw it coming, really, is that we started out with plastic and everybody was anti-plastic, and you had other indus industries um, talking about how bad plastic was. But the problem is disposability. Um, every single product and pack has got its own impacts, and it's really about making sure that we're using the most appropriate one um, and having a strategy as to, as to how and why we're using it. And then just touching very briefly on the, the poll there that we're looking at as well, um, fiscal mechanisms, so taxing high-impact packaging materials. I'm not quite sure how well that will go down with um, packaging or with the packaging industry, but also consumers, because... We've also got to factor in that moving towards better, more environmentally sound and, and, and socially inclusive packs has got to be financially inclusive and available to everybody, not just uh, people who's, who's got high, who have high household incomes. This is start to get more exciting, even more exciting as we get further on. Um, I now would like to talk, uh, joined again um, by Chris, who's going to talk us through the three innovation tracks and um, this really interesting concept of societal in innovation, uh, both of which are key to the approach in the state of sustainable packaging. Uh, and to ground this thinking in reality, we're going to be joined by the very inspiring Tom Zaki, who is the CEO um, of TerraCycle and Loop. Tom could not be here in person, however, we're actually quite pleased to some extent because the benefit is a much um, lower carbon footprint for Tom and potentially, I'm sure, for the KIDV. <laughs> every, uh, every cloud has a silver lining. Um, good morning, Tom. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning, Tom. How are you? Doing well, and um, thank you again for inviting me today. Very nice, to, uh, very nice to have you over here. I think that you're over in New Jersey, so I think we're okay with the social distancing measures at the moment. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. <laughs> okay, just checking. Never quite know. Uh, so let's get started. Um, Tom, you're going to help me um, help Chris kind of ground these academic and industry sort of principles in reality. Um, Chris, if, if we can get started, would you better start by explaining this concept of societal innovation for us? What exactly do you mean? Well, um, if, we, if we talk about innovation, most, most people uh, think about product innovation or process innovation, making other materials, making other products. If, if I mention societal innovation, then uh, we are more or less uh, looking at uh, innovate the societal, the societal system as such, which, in, if I may have this, my slide from, let's say, um, uh, the, where we can ask questions to the society from left to right or right to left. I don't know whether we have this slide. We have a slide, I think, which talks about we have product and packaging. It's just coming up on the screen. Okay. Yes. And, and if you look at that slide, and you uh, you can you can you can look at the problem from two sides. You can say, well. How can we innovate from the product and the product packaging combination towards, let's say, more sustainable solutions? Which is kind of where we are now, right? Where we are now, and it's more, more or less saying, well, if, if, uh, if we know how we have the shampoo bottle now, how we can we improve the shampoo bottle for the future? If you are asking the question, so you can ask yourself, how can we improve our shampoo bottle? If you go from the other side, society's needs and, and wishes, and you ask people, how do you want to wash your hair? Which is a totally different question. And this is the crux for me about the, the right, asking the right questions. Exactly. From barrier properties and the design aspects through to actually consumer demand and influencing more res responsible societal um, demands and lifestyles. Yes. And also, if we, if, we, if we shorten the supply chain, for example, now we buy everything at the supermarket, but if, if it's possible to have your grocery nearby, which, which is also, let's say, affecting the whole system around cities or, or villages in the future. This is maybe rather, maybe a little bit dreaming what I do now, but it is. I think uh, we have to f we have to go to more societal innovation procedures and 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 well adventures maybe. And, and I'd like to, to bring Tom in on that question because uh, Tom and I have had some great conversations about sort of re redesigning the system or actually, you know, what. Are we looking in? Are we spending and investing time in the right areas, or do we need to really rethink how we approach packaging? What's your thoughts on that, Tom? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think we have to think about what stakeholder connection, what uh, aspect, and when can those actions occur. So, 
if we take the shampoo bottle just as a, as a case study, the shampoo bottle will look the same and we will experience shampoo the same tomorrow as we do today. And so in the immediate, we have to think about what we would call these sort of simple steps towards a more circular economy. How do we make that shampoo bottle easier to recycle? How do we make it for more recycled content? And to do those things uh, urgently. Then I think if we think about within the scope of uh, large organizations, you know, let's take in the world of shampoo, your L'Oreal's, your P&G's, your Unilever's, who are very invested in a certain way to deliver the idea of uh, cleaning your hair. There, I think the more realistic approach will be to think about the more classic approaches on circular economy, you know, getting it recycled and, uh, uh, and from recycled content and maybe even moving into reusable uh, forms, or, but still not debating the bigger question that was just asked, which is, you know, what do we want out of a, uh, 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 you know, out of our hair and how do we want to clean it? Now, on the other side, small actors, uh, startups, disruptors, uh, folks who may not have the huge um, infrastructure burden uh, that a large uh, producer may have, there, I think, is where the opportunity comes to ask the question, what should our relationship be with how we clean our hair? You know, as a fun personal example, you know, COVID has afforded me a chance to try not washing my hair all year. And actually, I have to say, I don't understand the point of shampoo and conditioner. That's what the kids are doing, I think, these days, isn't it? Right. But, you know, so, so that is a very difficult conversation for a big producer who has uh, stakeholder commitments, shareholder commitments to ask. But it's a very appropriate question to be asked by disruptors. And we're seeing a lot of disruption come up in, 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 in questions such as this. And then that is also where I think individuals have a role because they're the ones who are being served by these products. Uh, so I think we have to come to it from both aspects simultaneously, but also acknowledge that there's different actors that can achieve these goals uh, 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 versus putting it all on the large producer uh, 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 because it may not be as realistic. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, and I think it's really useful to think about is it's more kind of more entrepreneurial mindset in terms of where we've got the big businesses and then we've got the startups and, and the products and, and, and the way that they're developing products and packaging together. Um, I'd like us now to start looking at the three different innovation tracks. So we've got recycling, circularity, and intrinsic sustainability. Chris, can you just walk us through the journey first before we then dig a little bit deeper into um, each one? Yes, it's nice that you call it a journey because I think it's a part of the path of humanity what we're looking at. If we're looking uh, to the very past, which might called, be called autarky, um, we used to live with, let's say, resources which were, let's say, not uh, a, a contaminating in the environment. Uh, this is my, not, not even my grandfather or the father, his father, his father, but maybe hundreds and hundreds of years ago. I think this is a, a, a romantic uh, history. Um, and, and, but we are now in, let's say, the gray areas. And the gray areas are the, 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 um, the, uh, the, the waste streams and the product streams going from linear to recycling to circular. And, uh, or, or apparently circular, because of what, yes. what we're recognizing that actually a lot of them that uh, are considered circular or marketed as circular actually aren't in practice. Yes, yes. I will give some examples later on what, what we, can, we right. can put in the, in the, in the recycling uh, scheme and in the circular scheme. And um, obviously, we might find it a fine thing to think about uh, that we uh, should end again in a green area where we have, let's say, the, well, the societal innovation results in terms of biosphere compatible solutions. So um, when you talk about microplastics, nanoplastics as a possible risk for the future, you might try to, to close the loops uh, with recycling or with, with, uh, with circularity models. But I predict that you won't be able to close it to fully 100%. So you accumulate, you can accumulate this kind of uh, future con con contaminations. And what's your, do you have any thoughts on that, Tom, in terms of obviously we started out being at one with nature, biosphere compatible, um, and then over time we've become, you know, we've, we've created these kind of me mechanically recyclable, for, for a better phrase, words in, in terms of packaging that's enabled us more convenience to move around, look after, have, have products shipped, shipped from all over the world. Um, we've integrated recycling, of which we are arguably at the beginning of a journey. Uh, I think we've got a lot to do. We're doing a lot as well. It's, it's worth recognising all the hard work that is going on. And then sort of cir circularity, I think that... What's your thoughts on sort of how people are integrating the circular economy versus this idea of intrinsic sustainability, which... Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? 
Absolutely. Um, so first, just as a quick point to talk about on recycling, I think the big challenge in the entire ecosystem on recycling is that we're designing into what could be recycled, not what will be recycled. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is could means can something be recycled in a laboratory without the concept of money entering into the equation, which frankly is just about anything because we're quite creative people and we know how to more or less consume any material type. But what we really need to be asking, which is what makes something actually recyclable in a country, is can a waste management company do so while generating a profit? Until recycling is a fundamental public service, that is the only question that we should be focused on. I just want to highlight that because that's a huge divergence we're seeing in pragmatic uh, solutions around be making things more recyclable, like you mentioned, uh, flexible packaging earlier. Now, you, I, I think this is what's really exciting about this conversation for me, is it's addressing finally the white elf elephant in the room, which most of, uh, uh, I'd say, related discussion do not. It, it ends short of this idea of intrinsic uh, uh, circularity. And the, the, the important things that we have to think about in that is our role uh, as consumers, because we're voting for these systems all day long. You know, we can blame uh, producers, uh, we can blame retailers, we can blame marketing, but we are spending our money voting for them. And the real change that's happened since our grandparents and their grandparents' day is this idea of total net volume of products being consumed. Because in the end, I would argue there's hardly a product that is truly intrinsically circular, right? The question is, how much of that can the planet uh, 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 handle? How much can be replenished? And uh, that is really the question, because every environmental issue, bar none, whether it's waste, which we're talking about here, but also air quality, the fact that we're in a, a, a mass extinction right now, and other you know, very meaningful issues are linked to our uh, effect on the environment by extracting resources, mining, farming, and so on. Now, we can do those things better. We can do those things in a more holistic, uh, thoughtful, regenerative way. But even an organic farm uh, done everything perfectly is, is, is not a forest anymore. Uh, and so the real basic then uh, lever we can affect is this idea of volume. And for us to really move you know, to this, the, the answer that we have to be in, I think no matter what, uh, intrinsic sustainability is both what are the options available to us, that's where innovators and companies can provide them, but then also our entire relationship with the volume of consumption so that we can come into balance with what this small planet can provide uh, 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 and that, in, in other words, we cannot be intrinsically sustainable while gouging ourselves on consumers. I couldn't have put the words better myself. Um, perfectly crystallised, and thank you for saying it in such a, a concise, powerful way, Tom. Um, so we're going to just walk through the tracks individually, um, probably a, a little bit, a little bit swifter than, than we planned, because I think it's important to, to really kind of get that intrinsic, sustainable point home. So, Chris, can you just walk us through recyclability? It's the one that we probably know a little bit more about in general compared to the other two. Um, Two tracks. Yes, well, the first track, of course, is, is very well known, I think, also to the public of this webcast. It's about, circular, about re recycling. It's already in full swing in many countries. Uh, there are typical discussions. I have some examples. This is, for example, uh, an, uh, uh, an, well, a fully recycled soap bottle, which can be recycled again. So it's, maybe they call themselves circular. I don't know. It, it can, we can discuss about that. But we also know that if we used current best available technology in recycling, then we will, in the Netherlands at least, we will reach a maximum of about 70 or 72 percent of recycling rates. And that's really important when we've got companies making global goals around 100%, whatever, you know. Yes, but it doesn't mean that this is a bad example. I think of this course, is a very yeah. good example Absolutely. because the, 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 the cap and, 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 and the, 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 what is it? The you can separate sleeve it. Sleeve and, yeah. and, and the bottle itself yeah. is really an optimized recyclability outcome and uh, as a, 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 a new resource for, let's say, the, the, the future mm -hmm. uh, uh, round. And hopefully the product's the, great the, as well, circle. I'm sure. Okay, this, so this is a good example, yep. but even though it's a good example, it will still uh, be, let's say, um, uh, uh, partly 70, 72% achievable. Mm. Eggs, we know you can, you can, you can hold your eggs in, 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 in carton or in plastic and it's also re re recyclable and we have other 
Many, many examples. So, so we're sort of saying that recycling on its own is not the answer because we can't... No. You can't recycle everything. There will always be some residues, some outputs that you have... that will end up being linear, essentially. Yes, well, it will be part of the intrinsic sustainability future. Mm -hmm. So we will, we, will, uh, we will stay recycling, I think. Mm -hmm. But we have to be aware of the fact that this is not the, the end point. So I'm conscious we, we've, we've reflected a little bit already on the recycling in, in the conversation already. So I wonder whether we, if we move straight on to the circularity, because I think this is one that would be really good to get Tom's input on, especially in terms of, um, of his, his experience with Loop. Can you just talk us through this, Chris, in terms of some examples of, of, of what circularity means? Because it's a phrase that can mean a lot of different things. And there's a lot of discussions about this, this word circ uh, circularity. Um, uh, one might say that uh, circularity is the, is the situation when you avoid the waste stage, so you can reuse. I have an example also in the soap industry. This is uh, another, another bottle. You can use it in the, in, the, in, the, in the supermarket to refill it. The dilemma of this, of course, is this, is this the future practice? knowing that a, ref a refilled installation in a supermarket has, will take more room, and more handling, hygiene aspects, etc., are disadvantages. On the other hand, it is a reusable solution. We might call it circular, because you avoid the waste stage, you only use it. And, and, uh, but Coca-Cola calls their bottles being uh, made of 100% recycled PAT also circular. So there's a lot of discussion about what circular exactly means, but in fact it still has to deal with materials which are not biosphere compatible. So at the end this bottle will end up in, in waste somehow. And I think interestingly, I think Ecover have uh, are one of the new partners of Loop. Is that right? Well, uh, you mentioned the brand, so I was trying to avoid it. But okay, uh, this is uh, this is a, no, a part of Loop, and I know that uh, that uh, Tom is uh, is uh, is uh, is one of the one maybe the founder of Loop uh, uh, scheme. So I wonder how he looks at this this type of, let's say, uh, reusable packaging future. Yeah, cause, so of course, and I suppose circularity, you know, I've taken a, um, a washing liquid bottle into like a zero waste store, I've given it a wash and I've set, and, and it's a, essentially a, arguably a single use bottle, let's just say, yeah. got recycled content and you can refill it yourself. But obviously the loop version is still within circularity yes. as far as we're concerned, right, Chris? And, and, and Tom, can you explain, I don't know whether you need to use that particular example, but in terms of the loop principle, and circularity. Um, what are your thoughts around that in terms of kind of um, how circular those systems are and um, what some of the challenges are for us to integrate this and make it more widespread? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so I think the first overall question is, uh, you know, as we think about moving from linear to circular and then tightening uh, the circle, you know, which is our sort of classic uh, academic path on circular economy, First, let's do a comparison on, on single use versus reusable. It is important to note that it is uh, reusable is by far not the silver bullet, uh, but it is in many cases better, but not in all cases. And what you're really comparing is the uh, creation of a new product and that product's end of life in a single use package. Uh, so take the, uh, you know, the soap bottle that was first put up, uh, uh, that one would have to be made and molded. And then if recyclable would end up in a recycling stream and if not recyclable, it would end up in a disposal stream. And then a new bottle has to be made, ideally from recycled material. That's your comparison on single use. Your comparison on reusable is making that bottle and depreciating the cost of making that bottle environmentally over the total number of uses it may have. And important to note, nothing in the world lasts forever. Uh, uh, so that it would be that environmental cost divided by uh, uh, its durability index, let's say. And then you also have to add on the cost of transportation and cleaning, which is also not free from an environmental point of view. Now, you know, if you move from something like a plastic shampoo bottle uh, to an aluminum one, that tends to be about equal impact by the third use and then starts getting better after that. But it is important to measure that uh, and to be uh, smart about it because not all reusable packaging is better than its single use uh, counterpart. Now, the important lesson that we have learned in deploying Loop now all over the world uh, and working with uh, a lot of traditional uh, brand partners, some of you who, who you've already mentioned, is that people really, and the systems behind them, want to feel as traditional as possible. You know, people really like the convenience of uh, disposability, oh, sorry, of, of disposability. It's why disposability won in, starting in the 1950s and still wins today. Um, and many times reuse models uh, uh, compromise that. 
you know, by asking consumers to clean themselves, fill themselves and so on. And I think if we're going to really move to a more circular system quickly and at scale, we have to deeply honor uh, this idea of the fierce convenience afforded by uh, single use consumption. And how do we deliver that convenience in reusable models? Now, that may seem challenging, uh, but uh, it is absolutely possible to do. We're trying to do that uh, at Loop and there's other great examples trying to do it as well. But there's one silver lining, which is wonderful, which is that in a reusable package, uh, uh, the economics are also in the same mode. So in a single use package, that entire cost of the package is embedded into your purchase price. But in the reusable version of the same uh, package, it's just the depreciation of the package mm. that is embedded into the purchase price, which means that you can increase the investment in the pack by orders of magnitude. Uh, and that unlocks so much opportunity for packaging designers to bring out uh, a more uh, functional, more exciting, more beautiful, uh, uh, really future of consumption type packaging uh, uh, options. And I think that is the real opportunity for reusable practitioners to lean in on, is not just the sustainability of reuse, but how it can unlock future ways of interacting with products. Uh, I think it's a really great point, there. And I think it's especially from a design point of view, um, there's a lot of reusable packaging that I've seen out there that is kind of semi-disposable. It's not. It's been designed or approached with um, single-use sort of methodologies in terms of the technologies and the materials, so whether it's a coffee cup, um, those kind of things we, we definitely um, need to do better, and we can do, and I think there are definitely opportunities for packaging designers. So moving on just to intrinsic sustainability, because I think this is the one that is really important that we clarify. I've got, got a few minutes left to do that. Um, can you just walk us through this one, Chris? Yes. Uh, well, this is uh, our future uh, uh, hope and view uh, well, going to intrinsically sustainability, where we have the recycling loops, we have the uh, circularity loops, but we also have it uh, explored by, let's say, materials which are uh, biosphere compatible. Of course, if you want an egg, you can buy a chicken. And maybe this is one of the best solutions you have, but I assume that not everyone is able to have a chicken in their backyard. I also don't know what the carbon footprint of a chicken is at the moment. I don't know, but you have to feed it. So I don't think that this is, this is but it is a metaphor, a metaphor for, for let's say, um, uh, can we shorten the, let's say, the value chain lines for, let's say, production and consumption? which has, let's say, a huge impact on the choice of materials, the choice of the kind of packaging you need. And, 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 and so just because just I'm conscious of time, and one of the things that I think is really, that may not be so clear or that I want to just sort of, um, emphasize is this idea of, of chemicals, because when we talk about yeah. packaging, we're often focusing on recyclability and recycled content. And we're not thinking about the chemicals that go into the environment, the chemicals that are used, the additives, and where those bits of packaging end up globally, especially yeah. when, when waste is mismanaged and people are dying as a result of it. Can you just clarify what you mean about intrinsic sustainability in terms of the materials that are going in and the potential sort of uh, pollutant or chemicals that are coming out. We want, we want to get rid of those or minimize them. Yes, of course. And uh, th there are a lot of, there's a lot of new research done on new molecules. Uh, the biodegradables are, are coming up. The current, let's say, the current biodegradable plastics, which we focus on now in the Netherlands, are, let's say, more or less in competition with, let's say, how we treat waste. They are, they are not fit in the, the, the recycling loops. They are not fit in the, uh, in the waste treatment of, of compost and they are not welcome at paper recycling. So there is no, no uh, uh, track for those kind of uh, uh, biodegradable plastics. There's no clear journey at the moment, is there? No, cur exactly. Currently not, but, but I think in the near future, we shouldn't stop this innovation. We should, uh, and I know that there are, there are uh, chemical companies working on that issue and producing in the future, I think, wonderful new molecules with great, great barrier properties and also with great biodegradable properties in, 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 in the face of where they come into the environment. Mm. And on the eggs, on the eggs, we have a lot of discussion about this eggs uh, package, which is based on starch. And also for this package, it is in potato a Potato starch as well. Inject Sorry? It's potato starch. Right? Yes, it's about 80% starch and there's some fibers in it and some, some, some adhesive to make it, uh, to make it, uh, to make it a package. And well, this is what we call, but may, this might be an intrinsically sustainable way because it's a bio-based compatible material, mm -hmm. but it is not it's a processed in the waste stage as we know it as, as now. So you can burn it and take the energy out of it and to make new starch 
based uh, packaging from from potato peels, and uh, uh, or you can make it uh, in, in, do it in a fermentation uh, process to to get the energy out of it, and make it rene renewable in a new year of the, of the potato. So this uh, is yeah. also maybe... I have so many questions. There's never yeah. enough talk time. Yeah. I have so many questions for Tom as well around, obviously, the co compostable side of things in the States as well, which I've got a bit of an idea of. Um, running out of time, never enough time to talk about sustainable packaging. Um, however, I, I'd like to thank you both, Tom and Chris, for your input. Thanks for helping us um, flesh out those two sections. Um, and uh, if anyone's got any comments or questions, please don't forget to use the hashtag pack forward. Um, and the accounts that we mentioned earlier. Um, I hope that everybody has enjoyed the content so far today. Um, it's possibly no surprise to you, or some of you, that I'm um, a vegetarian. Uh, <laughs> but however, I've always considered this panel the meaty part. There's always a great pun in there somewhere, isn't there? Um, Tom, Chris, and I are joined by the other panelists to help me dig deep. Um, we really want to know what we need to accelerate, to walk, accelerate our journey towards better recycling, more circularity, and this newer concept, really, around intrinsic sustainability. So how can we all work together faster to unlock more progress together? So I'd like to welcome... Uh, first of all, Hildegarde McCarville, who is the CEO of Veolia Netherlands. Hi, um, Hildegarde. I apologise for anybody who's Dutch, where my, I have had a briefing about <laughs> ne the names, Good job. but it's not working, and I'm trying my best, so apologies. Um, and also, a um, uh, very warm welcome to Robert de Vrede, who is the Executive Vice President of Global Food at Unilever. Thank you. Hi, Robert. Thank and uh, also welcome back to uh, Roland Ten Klooster. Thank you. Uh, everybody here knows that I've been looking forward to this session for a long time. We've also had some really fascinating chats about um, so many different things. Uh, we all know it's a really complicated topic, and what I really want to try and do for the audience is to tr for us to try and theme it under three key things, which are society and also societal innovation, um, government uh, and policy, and then finally business and collaboration. One of the things that I was keen to do to start with is around this idea of transparency. Um, what I've noticed is that there's a lot, and greenwash essentially, so tying into the, to the consumer insight studies that we were watching earlier, is that what I've noticed is in the last couple of years, arguably as a result of Green uh, Blue Planet, there's been an increase of um, packaging converters and suppliers marketing things as recyclable when they are not recycled. Um, but then also, as a result, I think potentially some of the younger brands or the brands that um, have less experience or very good intent are therefore then passing those claims about recyclability onto the um, customer. Um, Robert, I, I suppose from your perspective, um, Unilever have always been doing a, a great job, in my opinion, in terms of uh, approaching that subject with, with a lot of responsibility. What are your thoughts around the opportunities that brands have got um, to positively influence, uh, well, two, two things actually, what, what, what's the opportunity for brands like yourselves to be able um, to positively influence them to do more recycling? And then the second part is, is what opportunity ha may you have to help customers get more involved in reuse? Yeah. Th well, thanks for having me. And, and, and this is a very good question. Um, you know, there's a huge obligation and a huge opportunity. And um, you know, I think brands are really good at helping consumers to solve their problem or serve their need. Um, we normally do that by being really focused and to the point, because you know, not many of our consumers take a lot of time, specifically for the products that we sell, you know, whether it's mayonnaise or something like that. It's not something that people study really long. So you come to the point and you start to summarize. The risk with, of course, when we're gonna talk about sustainable packaging, it's, it's a very complex story. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like Chris elaborated already earlier. You need to take a lot of things into account. What's about the packaging? What is the collection scheme about? What is then the recycling going to do? And that together defines its sustainability impact. So you see very a lot of manufacturers trying to get quickly to the point and celebrating their little part of the contribution but you have to take into account the full equation. Yeah? And I think that's the kind of tendency that we need to, uh, need, need to be cautious on. On the other hand, 
we have a massive opportunity to educate and to engage consumers. Mm. If I only put my mayonnaise again into a trans or into a recycled bottle, the mayonnaise doesn't look as attractive anymore because if we take virgin plastic, it sparkles, you know, and it really brings out the brilliance. If I take recycled PET, it becomes a bit grayish. So I can use that as an argument to not move because people will not buy me and then the sustainability impact will be limited. Or I can say, am I going to take a bit of my marketing money to actually land that money or to land that message? Yep. So I need to, because only side by side, I lose. If I start to tell the story and, and try to engage consumers on, look, you should buy my mayonnaise because this is what we do, yeah? you know, tastes as good but less waste, then we suddenly we've got traction. And I think that's the kind of challenge we need to embark on uh, to do so. So we need to make a marketing story, but we need to stay factual and take the whole cycle into account. And I think that's the tricky space. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's a lack of knowledge and sometimes it's a bit of opportunity. And I, and, and, and I have a lot of fear for that because um, that can actually do more damage than good in the end. So you know, we really need to make sure that we, t that we stay factual. A lot of brands are very nervous, aren't they? They, they? A lot of brands are doing a lot of work, but they don't quite know how to tell the story because they don't want to be under the, sp the spotlight for doing the wrong thing. Because I think from a media point of view, we can, we can tend to be quite critical. Yeah. I have a question to ask Hildegard on, on a second around, around some other examples of that in terms of uh, designing in sustainability and it being a positive thing. Um, but just coming back, coming back on the reuse side of things, um, where, what are your thoughts about the opportunity for, for, for your, you know, the Unilever brands, for example, to use their agency to influence things that are a little bit more complex, like reuse, where we're, we are dealing with really big challenges like convenience? Yeah. Well, look, there's, there's a lot that brands can do. And, and I think if you have a good marketing story, there's, of course, people you can convince. We need to watch out that, you know, we need, in the end, we need scale for this. Mm. So are we trying to offer the perfect solution to convert 1%, which is exciting, and we should definitely do that. But we need to take into account to really have the impact, we need to have the larger 99%. So um, we need to not ask too much of consumers. As soon as the story becomes too complex, I need them to go back to the store, I need them to, you know, wash packaging and all that kind of stuff they start to find it a hassle. And does this really contribute? And is that really my responsibility? And they might say one thing on video, but then in reality of the household, they actually do something else. You know, I know a lot about this topic, although I'm not, definitely not an expert, but I even have difficulty in my own household to explain my children and even my wife which bin should take what. Absolutely. Yeah? And it's that simple at the end of the day. To exactly. Which bin does it go in? That's what yes. we need to know. Yeah. So, so you know, you really have to watch out that you have the perfect system that nobody takes or that we've got a system that actually is allowing the mass to embark on. It doesn't dismiss us from going further, but you have to watch out that you try to sell something perfect which is not getting the mass. Mm. Yeah, it's a really good point. And, and I'll come back to you on, on the point about sort of um, impacts and, uh, you know, how and where strategically we can make those, those impacts qu quicker because yeah. obviously there is an element of urgency. Um, Hildegard, uh, we've spoken before about some other examples that you mentioned around um, shifts in recycled content and some other brands that are doing some good work to try and help sell in, you know, and ultimately, you know, design... Uh, talk positively about s s sustainable packaging and, and some of the credentials, so whether it's a graying of material or something being a bit less convenient, two, two very different factors. What are your thoughts on that in terms of any, of ex any other examples that you might have seen? Yeah, well, I think the first thing starts with our own organizations, you know, I, I, going back to what Tom and Robert said before, because even ourselves, to educate ourselves, have the same language, understand what it means, what we're giving up one for the other and why we're actually doing it, because I think it starts with us, starters. Mm. Um, um, and also then when we work with uh, brand owners and clients for their whole teams to understand this is maybe the consequence, as you said, you know, maybe it's, it's more opaque, but at the same end then it's, it's recyclable and being able to use that as a strength mm. in terms of marketing. So if I take, say, a company like Rickard Beckershire, they came out and said, okay, we're going to use uh, the finished tablets, we'll have uh, PP recycled. It's grey, it's not sparkly and shiny, but that, you know, then it's actually recycled. The same way that if you go for an apple, if it's a uh, waxed glass on it, then it's not organic. So using that as a position of, of strength, or uh, Tom will be aware of kind of uh, uh, join the pipe in, in relation to uh, an organization here that they make um, uh, bottles out of uh, uh, basically sugar cane. That's mm -hmm. normally went to waste, not part of the food chain. 
um, and actually using that for people who actually live convenience, but actually making it something attractive from a marketing perspective, so you can put the city on it, whether it's Amsterdam or Den Haag or wherever, and actually getting people to start being more of the solution. You know, it's attractive, it's convenient, but then you can fill it in your local um, municipal uh, water outlet in relation to where it is or your tap. So in bringing the client into it, engaging their stories in it and, it, and it takes time, but then it really has, and I think it's also uh, about the shift coming through where we've gone from that linear market to a kind of a more circular approach. And, and it means that it's not just industry, governments, NGOs, citizens. We have to make the change together, especially in this digital uh, social media based uh, economy that we have uh, now and, and how can we bring in citizens to, to actually be part of that uh, solution and that change whether it is going okay can we do a um, I'll give an example in Lyon at the moment we have 10,000 um, households linking in with a brand owner, linking in with an NGO to say, okay, can we take your pet packaging from your, your deodorants or your, your um, uh, washing products and can we collect that and maybe see can we close the loop locally? And that creates education, that creates awareness, uh, that creates the, the change. But also being willing to accept, you know, if it's like a, a, an AXO or a, or a paint packer company in, in the Netherlands, we can make it all from recycle it, but then you have to make the, the system switch. The outside may be the, the colour that you want, but the, the bucket may be grey as opposed to pure white. But, but okay, but readjusting what it means from a marketing team, a quality team, a consumer perspective, but knowing here's the full benefits that we actually have and celebrating the full benefits because mm. Uh, last point, I think sometimes as well we, we bring in new regulations or changes, but we don't celebrate what it actually means environmentally. So uh, levying single-use plastic bags in the UK, 2014 it was introduced. Yes, it was seen as negative initially, and I remember the time mm. myself as well. Um, but it saved uh, 7.1 billion bags annually. Why do we need 7.1 billion bags extra? It's crazy. So 140 bags per person down to 10. It just doesn't make any sense. We change our behaviors. We bring our bag with us in the car and it works perfectly fine in relation to where it is. Mm. So that systematic change, but engaging partners, I think it's, is really powerful, but also celebrating it. Not just we've put a law in to change it. Here's the benefit. Absolutely. So a couple of really great points that you've, that, that, that you've just raised in terms of this connection between sort of technical parameters in terms of packaging and then the societal acceptance of what recycled means. So is it, yeah, I, you know, we mentioned the example of, uh, I think it's Boris Johnson, when he had a single-use coffee cup um, and then his age ran, ran to it and, and got rid of it quite quickly. Um, we kind of need... Um, the technical nuances of sustainable packaging in terms of recycled content and even I had a... Uh, um, fizzy drinks bottle here in the hotel room which had a uh, w which had clearly been reused over and over and again it was a glass bottle for me I love seeing that kind of thing because I know that it's got a story it's got value to it and you know, I've got a reusable water bottle that I carry everywhere mm. because it because it's really valuable to me. Um, Tom, bringing you in on that point, what's your thoughts around where the US consumers are in terms of um, recyclability and any other sort of maybe other do you have any other case studies of where other brands might have been uh, trying to sell in sustainability in terms of the packaging design being a good thing rather than a negative absolutely um, so first I just want to echo uh, what was mentioned earlier uh, this idea that we really have to meet uh, the consumers where they are uh, and you know what consumers really want today and the data shows this over and over is affordability Mm. convenience, and then of course, the product filled with features and benefits. And sustainability is, a, is an absolute feature and benefit. Um, but we have to, especially if we're going to ask for new modes, uh, as you were asking earlier on reuse, we need to really honor the idea of convenience and, and think about that deeply, because if not, it's absolutely right. We're only going to talk to, to 1%. Now, as you asked about uh, uh, the US, I mean, we do operate all over the world, so we have some interesting sort of comparison data. And I'll, uh, this one's sort of a bit comical, but we were looking at uh, the countries of the UK, France, uh, and the US, which is where uh, uh, the reuse platform we run, Loop, is live. We were asking consumers, how much do you care about the environment versus how much are you willing to do uh, uh, incrementally for it? Uh, that could be paying more. That could be even trying a new platform. It doesn't have to be just monetary or a little bit less convenience, whatever that may be. And uh, uh, you know, there's a little comedy in this. The, the French market of those three markets indexed the highest on caring, but the lowest on willing to do anything. The Americans <laughs> on the other end indexed the lowest on caring, but the highest to be willing to do anything about it. And the Brits were just in the middle. 
So it's, it's interesting that it's not always linear, uh, you know, the thought process, right? Um, and how people are willing to, to react. I think what, what is important for brand owners to take away uh, from this is that there is a groundswell of, uh, of, of concern for the planet. I think that's only being accentuated with what we're living through with the pandemic and all the other uh, uh, major challenges of this year and, 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 and this time we're living in. Um, but the systems that are there to help us be able to solve for these uh, are, are challenged you know, for macroeconomic reasons and so on. Uh, but there is this desire and it's a global desire. It's not something that is really, you know, very different geography by geography, but we also don't, should not make these platforms too aspirational because then we read about them in magazines, we aspire to them, and then we never execute them. Mm. I completely agree, by the way, people are never who they are when you ask them, they're always much better human beings. And then we are <laughs> not really nice people when we're shopping. We're very selfish uh, actors. Uh, and I am just as much a hypocrite on this as anyone else. But I think we can meet folks there. And then finally, uh, uh, you know, it's this great question of, do we uh, hide the sustainability piece because it's, it, it, it doesn't feel as virgin or as new? Mm. And I think this comes from the fact that we approach our products in what I would say a virgin mentality, right? We used to make them from virgin materials. So now that we look at maybe making them from recycled content, we want that recycled content if we're a producer to behave economically and from a performance point of view, the same as virgin. So it's looking at recycled content from a virgin sort of point of view. The, 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 the way to embrace it, both uh, in, in the pricing, the performance, and then how you communicate that is to not look at it from a virgin point of view and really embrace this idea of, of making the product circular, using waste to make it, uh, and, uh, and going almost a completely opposite direction, because then you're changing the landscape completely uh, 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 and setting up a new set of rules. And some brands uh, have done that phenomenally well, but it does take a step change versus sort of an incremental uh, uh, approach. Um, but it's an exciting time and lots of really great examples uh, out there. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Tom. I'd like us to shift uh, the conversation more towards um, business and collaboration, especially bearing in mind the Pack Forward movement that we're wanting to, to develop and, and, and uh, move forward. Um, I'd like, well, I suppose just to give a bit of context, my experience is that there has, and I mentioned earlier, that there is um, a skills gap. So uh, I've noticed from all sorts of different academic um, uh, levels or, or um, school ages, or whether it's university, um, postgrad, etc., whether it's design, manufacturing, engineering, I'm always astounded that the basic principles around you know sustainability or looking after the environment and, and, and caring for people as well don't really seem to be integrated as core um, uh, subjects in, in, in these areas. Mm. And I wanted to ask yourself, Roland, what's your experience in terms of in the Netherlands, or, or maybe you, you've got an understanding of further afield, around people in the packaging sector, whether we've got packaging technologists, packaging engineers, packaging designers, and also people in the packaging conversion, com converter sector. Are we missing some skills? What, what kind of gaps do we need to close? Oh, it's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, man, you could say many caps. On the other side, I think that in the, um, in the area of the, the packaging producers, designers, engineers, and the converters, there's a lot of knowledge and insight is present. But um, in the media and under the public, it's absolutely not. That That's, in my opinion, very clear. In many educational programs, there's a lot of uh, knowledge about sustainability taken up. I mean, e eco design started in the early 90s and it's integrated more or less in, in, in many educational programs. And if I talk to packaging technologists, they understand the issue. They, they have read the reports, etc. So that's not the biggest uh, problem. But um, the gap is caused more or less by uh, um, the, the big step to marketing because you have to sell the product and I think this, is, this uh, has been explained by, by Robert as well as, uh, as, as by Chris and, and Tom also uh, gave some great examples and, and that's really hard and on the other side uh, I mean when, when we go back to Pack Forward and we see the first part recycling um, we are talking about all the problems but um, until now I didn't hear all the research and innovations that are going on in that field we know that that no uh, recognition techniques are being used. We, we can find just single cups from certain brands. We can take them out uh, at that level. We can also make the plastics very small and then sort them and all kinds of things. And this is all ongoing development and research. But um, uh, to give you an example, uh, I know plastic 
plastic packed in the Netherlands is working on polypropylene food to food recycling. We are, we are really trying to find the cups back in the waste and then bring them back to food purposes. And this is rather new. And, but I think there is much more possible uh, from that perspective as well. So in, in all these three three areas, I think mm. we will we will make a lot of progress. So, so and absolutely, you're absolutely right that there is a huge amount of expertise in the industry. I think my, my query is whether we're thinking about the the, the people aspect in, term, in terms of th- sort of responsible sourcing. So I think that, we've, I think that we're, we're getting there on the environmental side of things. Uh, Robert, can I bring you on, in on that? What, what are your thoughts around um, the, yeah. that, 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 the, the difference? When we talk about sustainable packaging, I think we generally talk about the, the environmental impacts. We might be talking about life cycle analysis, carbon recyclability, for example. I think we, when we think about the intrinsic sustainability, it's quite interesting for me because we are thinking more about the farms, the soils. You know, the soil conversation is not as loud as it should be and could be and probably <coughs> will be. Agreed. What are your thoughts? Because obviously that, that covers the, the sourcing of the food and the, 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 the packaging itself. Yeah, I th- look, for me, I think the knowledge gap is... There's a lot of knowledge. What people tend to do, they, you know, they stay within their own territory. And we need more people that look over the fence. Um, if I challenge my marketeers, they will come with recyclable packaging. Mm. So all my soups will go to glass. It's going to get the popularity vote, but you know, the carbon dioxide is going to go through the roof if we do that in comparison to the packaging we use today. So we need people to you know, have a full life cycle analysis, yeah, to really take everything into account, including even the food waste. We Absolutely. don't package for the fun of it. I mean, it costs money, so we package with a purpose, yeah? So we need to take into account what is the idea behind it, what does then happen in the in-use, where do people bin it, yeah? I hope that they bin it, but if they bin it, where do they bin it, how is it then collected, and then what is the impact at the recycler for that? And I only started to get it once I was starting to speak, you know, and even visiting some of these sites. And then you're like, okay, so this is what the challenge is about. And I think that's the challenge we all need to take. So let's not optimize within our own, you know, capabilities, because we will not end up with the right result. We need to really take into account the whole aspect and then say, okay, what do we need to do? And you also need to dare to lean in a bit, because it's easy for me to say, look, I'll make my packaging recyclable, but I'm not going to use recycled content. Because then what is the recycler going to do with it? I mean, he or she needs to sell this in the end, right? We need an economical model, yeah? Because otherwise, again, we do something for those that can afford it, but those that can't will continue to do the unsustainable thing. And not because they're bad, simply because they don't have access to more. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to take that integrated lens, and I think that's where the challenge should be much more at. Yeah, so really, so really good point. And actually, when we think about inclusivity in terms of people having uh, access to to more responsible packs and products, um, one of the we had a really good question. Um, lots of fantastic questions that came in actually from from the participants. But one of them was around um, how can we better share knowledge from uh, from country to country? Um, mm-hmm. Hildegard, do you have any examples of that or any thoughts around I, that? I do, but I'm I'm going to build upon just what Robert said. Yeah, please do. Yeah. because. What we find, because we're normally we're working with the brand owners or the OEM partners in relation to it, and whilst there's a knowledge of recycling, we don't speak the same language. So, as we talked about before, what does recycling mean? Or, or and if we want to scale up, you know, if, if we're talking about um, mobile phone technology, it's GSM or other. If we're talking about adapters, it's two plug or three plug. You know, if we don't have the same language and if we don't have Um, uh, companies within a sector, whether it's electronics or infrastructure or packaging, using the same type of compounds will never speed up. And it was really interesting, um, MPO, as the the team here know, is a Dutch TV station and about a month ago they did an an insight investigative report in terms of plastic, you know, recycling. And there you see some brand owners or manufacturers and they have the feeling of, you know, poor quality, second hand, not virgin, does it smell? And and you really see they they don't understand and, and they're conditioned by maybe their, their background or their expertise to think, and again, they work in silos. And, and normally we find we might have the supply chain person or the raw materials person or the person in charge of sustainability knocking on our door. And you know, six months later, maybe it's the, uh, the quality assurance person or the marketeer, and then suddenly there's a problem. So that holistic approach, you're changing an ecosystem, you know, how, do you, how do you actually do it? I think that's really important, because I agree there's expertise, but not cross-board, cross-collaboration. We're, we're, it's a circular economy, it's a different way of working than before, if I can build upon that. Mm. And then the, the second point in terms of 
the collaboration, I think it, it goes back to business to business, and we see it as well, if I talk from that, uh, I look at somebody like LC Packaging that makes about 11 million big FIBC bags that, that you'll know, and, and how do they bring all their, their, their clients and their uh, suppliers and partners all come together in order to do that, that closed loop, bring it back in and, and make a second element of it. And even um, virgin uh, producers as well, whether it's the lines to, uh, lines to end plastic waste, bringing them to the table and actually bringing them as part of the solution. We, we, it's not that we don't want to use plastic, it's just we want to make sure that we don't have this impact on, on the environment, and that's down to us as consumers as well in terms of convenience should not come at the cost of the environment. We have a responsibility um, in, 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 in relation to that. And then I think that it's, it's forums like this, it's being able to create that network where we can leapfrog mm. and, and, and we can come together. And I think um, especially in the Netherlands, I've, I've, I've noticed that we have uh, the different chemist institutes like KADV or Polymer Science Park and working together and, and replicating that, um, that knowledge that we can have it for, as I said, a market sector mm. uh, coming through. And I think also the other lesson to be learned is we must respect the ecosystem in each, each uh, region. So Absolutely. if I'm looking at trying to do um, design for life and, and circular solutions here with, with clients, uh, that's a very different approach than I will have in terms of the, the waste collection and the processes and the, the systems here compared to Indonesia, where actually it's somebody's livelihood to collect the waste. So if we're building a, a pet recycling facility there, then you, you don't take away the ecosystem of that person. Instead, you work with them and, and, and actually support that and, and bring that systematic change through in order to recover. So I, I think it's about looking at a holistic solution and, and not being afraid of open innovation and, and you're not always going to be the expert, that's fine, but I think you can have your expertise, but that cross-collaboration is needed if we're going to radically change what we're doing. Definitely. I think you touched on something really important in terms of, um, you know, especially the, uh, a number of different global brands that we've worked with in terms of some of these challenges around products that are going into market where there are some really big challenges around waste management infrastructure. And so while there might be some great solutions that in theory could be recycled in, in, in some nations, when we think about emerging markets or developing nations, it's making sure that, you know, that's where people and planet are completely and utterly intertwined more so potentially because it is people's livelihoods. And I think that, I think that there's a lot more awareness needs to be, uh, would be helpful, I think, if, if we had a bit more awareness around that in terms of people's livelihoods. Um, one of the questions that I was keen to ask, it's a bit of a biggie, but um, <laughs> uh, how we currently measure success and growth? Um, a little bit of a, a one in terms of kind of the crossover between government and policy and business and collaboration, because ultimately, if we think about um, growth, we measure it on sales, and you know most of our sales are through disposable business models and through disposable packaging, and we're not necessarily thinking about measuring the value. We're, we're, we're thinking about resource scarcity and about protecting the, the resources that we're using. Many of them are, are going are being lost in linear systems. So how can we better? measure uh, and um, uh, increase the value that, that, that we have to materials. Um, and I, I suppose for me, reuse is an interesting area uh, for that, because if we can design in more value into products and packs that we do keep for life or that we do maintain, we do personalize, we can reuse, wash, etc. we can protect those resources um, uh, for, for, a, for a longer period. Um, who to ask the question to? That's the that's the question. Uh, I'm going to go to the design, the, the design guru. <laughs> Sorry, Roland. Um, what are your thoughts on yeah. that? How can we better? How can we manage that? How? It, it's a big question, but I'm going to throw it. It's out. a big question. I was, I was um, uh, happy to read. It was, I think it was last week in the newspaper. And some some research they uh, incorporated the the not taking up costs. Uh, in a product or something. So uh, it can be uh, uh, children labor, it can be emissions in the other side of the world, it can be a huge amount of transport which is supported by uh, uh, not paying taxes on the, on the fuels, etc., etc. And if you take your real cost into account, then, and, and from that perspective, that is really people, planet, profit, and that's what I really liked. And uh, once when it started, moreover, I think we'll, it will grow because we will have the insight, the knowledge, we have social networks and all the insights and all these networks will grow and finally this will, will cause some change but this, of course it will be really difficult. 
Mm, no, I agree. And I wonder, um, Tom, we've talked about this uh, idea of kind of degrowth. So if we're looking at um, not, if we're looking at using less, but also having you know successful businesses, how might those two go together? Um, it's a good question. Uh, maybe we have to shift the conversation from absolute revenue growth to uh, market share ownership, uh, uh, but it is a very, very challenging one. I think we can uh, make short-term steps. You know, the uh, the example I was just you know referenced of this idea of embedding externalities, that comes up quite squarely in reusable models, especially models where the producer must must take the package back. So if you think about beverages in Germany, beer in Canada, the, the loop system you know, that, that we work on, there the producer is obliged uh, in the system to take responsibility back of the package. Now that is incredibly exciting because now the producer uh, is not producing for basically the end of life, when, uh, which would be defined as when there's no content left in the package, uh, and maybe some more uh, open-minded producers thinking about what happens with that package, uh, and not all do by, uh, uh, you know, mind you. But now thinking about, I have to be able to recover it, I have to be able to clean it, I have to be able to refill it, I have to design it so that it can age through multiple cycles in a way that will still be exciting to the next consumer and the one after. That's not necessarily embedding all externalities, um, but it is a major example of what I would call voluntary externality embedding. Uh, Non-voluntary is the role of the, of the governments. And, uh, and uh, for example, we're seeing a huge leaning in in Western European markets. Uh, France, for ex ex example, is pa passing legislation forcing fast food coffee shops and restaurants to uh, mandate reusable packaging uh, to consumers if they're eating in. And that's a huge step change. Uh, uh, and so you have those, those two levers. But I think that's a great example, though not yet addressing our overall relationship uh, 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 with consumption. And that, I think, is very challenging in the context of business where uh, you know, we have to quarterly report to shareholders uh, uh, and we are measured really on growth. If you're not growing, you know, then uh, and the market will not treat you kindly and likely replace whoever is driving the boat and put someone else who is much more focused on growth uh, uh, you know, in control. So that question of degrowth, I think, is going to be very difficult for business to address but it is absolutely in the hands of individuals. Uh, it is what we make exciting. It is what we uh, uh, prescribe value to and build culture around. Uh, you know, if you think about the, 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 you know, the past few decades we have lived through, um, you know, we are measure our status in society by how much stuff we have. Uh, and that is the question that we need to ask, but I think we cannot ask it in the concept of business. We need to ask it in the concept of culture uh, and how, how we gain happiness. Uh, it's a very difficult question to ask, but I think that will be what we must ask because if not, the environment will force us uh, uh, to ask it. I think, you know, what's exciting to me about intrinsic sustainability, it's not, can we get there? We will get there. There's no question. The only real question is, are we gonna get there with pain and suffering as we are today? Or are we gonna get there uh, 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 in a positive uh, uh, fashion, but I guarantee no matter what the world will force us there. Uh, and I think uh, that way, let's do that without um, losing lives along the way and harming uh, uh, you know, our fellow citizens, the plants and the animals along the way. Theresa, can, can I build to that? Please do, Robert, absolutely. I, you know, I would want us to prevent that there is one single KPI that we should chase. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually one of the problem creators. You know, there's Agreed. many things that we need to do. And you see in many parts of legislation, for instance, we tend to focus on one single issue. And the risk of that is that we lose the bigger oversight. Yeah? So we need, to, we need to look at a few things combined, right? So driving recyclability is one thing, but we need to make sure that we understand the impact on carbon dioxide, for instance. Yeah? Because Absolutely. maybe that last bit of recycling is actually not beneficial for the environment because it's taking a huge amount of energy. Mm. I like that, that Tom raised the extended producer responsibility. And I think that is a very crucial one to make the next steps. But you have to make sure that you do it in a right way, because if you give people the responsibility, you also need to give them the responsibility to change some of the things in the system. So if you want to hold producers responsible, which I think is a very smart thing, you should also give them you know, a way to influence the collection systems. And what we see now in certain countries is that we have producer responsibility, but they have to use certain systems that governments have installed. Mm. Now, that might have happened at the time with the right kind of insights, but times evolve, science evolves. And we see new methodologies actually becoming more efficient. Do you need to separate the waste, or do we do separation after collection? Yeah? And that sometimes still lacks. So 
I'm really a believer of EPR, but then you also need to make sure that you enable those that you hold responsible, and you need to put the right kind of legislation in place. And very often we have legis it takes a long time to do legislation and we need governments to speed up in that area. However, COVID is a great example in the of the European Union that yeah. we can't use recycled plastic apart from PET, mm -hmm. which everybody's mm -hmm. shouting about. But there's a lot of part of plastic still in the in that we can use also from a recycled contact within food packaging. It's simply not allowed. Are we capable? Yes. Is the technology safe? Yes. Could we do it today? Yes. It's not allowed. And that's the kind of stuff, and that doesn't matter because it was done at the time with the right kind of wisdom. But you know, wisdom evolves because science evolves, and we need to make sure that we get that kind of stuff also in traction. I couldn't I agree couldn't. more, and I know that Hildegard and I have talked about this yeah. as well around, you know, you know we've got, uh, and it moves us very beautifully, smoothly onto the, 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 the area of sort of government and policy. And uh, as you mentioned, a lot of the policies and strategies that exist are out of date, I think, and, and, and irrelevant today, ultimately, to some extent. I'm sure they were very relevant at the time, um, but, but we're in a situation where we need to, need to move faster. And... Uh, you know, we've got mechanisms such as EPR, um, uh, lots of different things that are going on globally. My experience is that a lot of the policies and strategies are focusing in the main around recycling disposable packaging better or including recycled content. Mm. We talked a little bit, Chris, around the, the different tracks around recycling, circularity, and intrinsic sustainability. There's also a lot of sort of other um, government strategies that might be talking about sort of biodiversity or um, other aspects of circularity, but they don't really seem very joined up. Um, Hildegard, Hildegard, what are your thoughts on um, what potentially, what, government, what policies and strategies, what are some of the barriers that were existing at the moment that we could really do with um, redesigning? Sure, I'll build upon what Robert and, and Tom actually said. So if I take the KPI, I agree, it's not one fits all. So if you take the one in terms of we must have a higher recycling rate, that's fantastic. But if you can't actually use something with what is actually recycled because the quality is less, it's, it's pointless. And I also agree that when we look at holistically at something, we should look at maybe what is the, the carbon you know, footprint and impact. And it's interesting this week uh, in the Netherlands with the announcement of the new budget and you know the cost of carbon will go nearly fourfold. So are we going to look holistically? How do we measure our success as, as, as companies and as businesses? And I think that's also where um, building on what Tom said, I think it's more going to be a, a, an ecosystem overview that we have to look at uh, uh, long term because this quarter by quarter results, you know, that, that made sense in industrialization at the time, but does it make sense now? Do we move more to a B Corp where we reward companies that actually have a lower carbon footprint in, in the market rather than fast growing and, and quarter by quarter EBITDA? Because is that sustainable? You know, and can we allow companies the time to make that change and invest? And I think that's something that we must address as part of it as well, because otherwise you're still working at ecosystem with the same pressures and will you get the change? Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a questionable and it also goes back to what do we want to reward? Mm. But going back to uh, uh, Robert's part also in terms of standards, I completely agree. Uh, we have one client at the moment that is making their products from recyclate. They're not in the food packaging. They're in uh, um, infrastructure. And there's legislation that was correct at the time, but means that actually for infrastructure, for water sewage pipes or, or for uh, water pipes, that actually only virgin can be used and not recyclate. Why? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, it, it lasts the same. And, and also standards apply then. Do they need to apply now in the market and the environment that we... Um, that we uh, actually live in. And, and going back to your point about, um, we have the technology now. I know for us, we have tested for, for clients uh, like yourselves in relation to how we're able to make food packaging from PP and, and PE. And the, the blocker is not the technology, the scalability, the affordability. It's the FSA or the regulations which actually are now are not fit for purpose. The same way when we went from traditional retail banking to online banking, we have to evolve and, and move. And, and for me, then that goes back to, uh, from a government perspective, do we put in, I mean, um, uh, recyclate need or in use of, of recyclate in terms of all packaging or products? I, I think for that to spur the innovation, but also to spur the change in terms of those standards which are no longer applicable from when they were actually set. Because I think there's a willingness, but again, you know, you for our, our clients and we see them, they have to be able to sell their end product. If they legally can't do it or they're blocked from doing it, mm then it stops the whole transition and the change and the demand and the offtake uh, through the process. 
So, some really great points there, and I'm going to um, uh, ask Chris a question actually around, uh, you know, are these are some of these barriers and blockers, especially when we're thinking about policies and standards that are at, are in, in need of updating, and forums where people can come together and throw their frustrations in, uh, uh, you know, is that the kind of thing that Pack Forward could do locally but also globally around other nations that may potentially be looking to integrate standards and going down some of the paths that we've got frustrated by? Yeah, the answer is, is yes, it could be. It depends also on the, on the, on the, the whole, say, uh, uh, the, the total of uh, people who are involved in, the, in, in, in Pack Forward. Um, but I think the struggle is also for the government is now what kind of system, what kind of processes are really helping us? Because they are dealing with individual companies in, let's say, plastic pacts in the Netherlands, in France, in the UK, in the European Union. So we already have four plastic pacts for companies who are selling in UK, France, European Union. So this is... This is a struggle. I feel it as being a struggle from the government. So how can we change... Uh, the, 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 the system or how can we change the, the whole material flows to more recycled material should we describe and should we uh, ask the market to, to, to apply a minimum of 35% or a minimum of 50% of recycled mm. material in non-food mm. uh, packaging why can we package let's say this kind of this kind of things uh, soaps, etc., or, 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 or paints, why can't we say, well, in fact, 100% re re recyclate is used for that kind of products unless there is not uh, enough available on the market? Of course, which is a, which so, is a key challenge. Of course. Yeah. And then uh, uh, the, the brand owners using this, this recyclate can, can tell, well, uh, 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 an, a, a national government saying, well, I'm not able to have it fully 100%, but I haven't done my, my best to do it as much as possible. So I report 80%. Next year, I'll report 90%. And the year after, maybe 100%. So I think there is a need for such some, uh, for, uh, for, uh, uh, obligations. But on the, on, the, on the other hand, if there are too many rules, then innovation will be steered by those rules. Mm. And the freedom of looking differently to the subjects are decreasing. So... Not too many rules, but and good processes. Level, right? mm. so, yeah. so national governments, if you take a Western European view, markets are much bigger than a single country in Western Europe. So you need EU legislation in that sense. Mm -hmm. cool. Sustainability yeah. loves scale. Yeah? And I think the Green Deal is actually a positive example, in my view, yeah? um, where you see that it's much more one integrated view and, okay, what are we trying to achieve here? And we need more of that, but you need it at a pace. Yeah? And, and, and I think, you know, knowledge institutes like the KIDV are really helpful there because we tend to have thought, okay, so companies, they're colored because they need to deliver growth every quarter. But, you know, governments need to win from election to election because otherwise the power moves again. And even NGOs, you know, they're often dependent on funding also from, you know, the popularity vote. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that there's independent voices that says, whoa, 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 wait a second, yeah? If we take all things together with what science knows today, then this is where we should be looking at. But we need to make sure that we do it on a large enough scale, otherwise we get competition, and, you know, the virgin plastic paint containers will simply be shipped in, the consumer will buy it, because he or she says, look, why should I pay more for the same paint? Mm. Yeah? So you, we need to make sure that we take that into account. Yeah, yeah definitely. Can I, yeah, just, just to add to that, but mm. because many people think uh, photo, photo recycling plastics is not allowed. That's not true. You, legislation in Europe is very clear. It states, if you do it, show it is safe. So the source is food, and then all the steps are safe as well. And the problem is that this, cause, this is causing difficulty. For PET bottles, for one brand with, with refund system, it's easy because they get back their own bottles and they can recycle them. For the other ones, they have to prove if you have a polypropylene cup for yogurt, you have to prove it's the same cup that you're using for a new package. But in my opinion, it takes just, uh, um, uh, well, maybe a few years, and then the technology is up to the level that we can do that. But the question is, do we want to do that? Mm. With the hazards and all the, all the other options, are, are there better solutions on, 
on a higher scale, you know, then, then think about, still the question is, how do we get our food in our home at the right time, the right quality, the right taste, and what we want to eat every day? Mm -hmm. So, and do we need a packaging for that? Or can we do it in another way? Or can we use uh, reusable systems or refillable systems, etc.? And this is only one part of it. And in my opinion, um, in the 50s, the plastic industry started growing and we came to a, to a fantastic level, but it's only a one-way level. And we cannot change the level in two years or something. It, we need more time. Mm. To, to bring it, to, to take up the, the, the last part of the chain as well. And I think we'll, we will get further than many people think. Mm. Tom, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Uh, it, it's, it's a really a, a, a important topic. And I think, you know, one of the challenges, as uh, uh, was already mentioned, is that as you look at legislation around the world, a, a wonderful case study of this is the, the emotional banning of the plastic straw, you know, that uh, went, you know, all over the world, is that many times these legislative st steps are populist steps. It's more a politician trying to get a headline mm -hmm. to try to get reelected, which is exactly what Robert was just describing earlier. And you know, if, if, if I could wave a magic wand on how legislation should be thought about to facilitate these sort of thinking, what we have to really focus on is the underlying economics and to help uh, the underlying economics be favorable to circular decision making. You know, a good example is many organizations, Unilever is a leading example, but many, many others have followed uh, the Alan MacArthur Foundation in making meaningful pledges in 2025 to be recyclable, compostable, uh, or reusable. And then more importantly, even, uh, or, or as importantly, uh, large amounts of recycled content. But here's the white elephant in the room. And mind you, we are four years away. We sort of lost 2020 in, uh, in, with, with a lot of other issues. Hmm. Um, if you map out all the commitments that companies have made for just a simple material type like recycled PET, the commitments are about 10 times higher than the available supply. We're, we're talking tenfold discrepancy, which means 90% of these well-meaning organizations will not succeed, full stop. Now, the, that's a great role of government to come in and fundamentally subsidize the economics of recycled content, because today, if I may be so bold, you know, if, I, if I'm sitting as a procurement individual on Robert's team, I, I would always want to prefer to buy recycled content as long as it's competitive in economics and capability. And that is not always possible. Uh, and that is a great role of, uh, of uh, funding dollars to be able to come in because the general challenge and why deposit laws work very well and EPR has to be very careful is, as mentioned, in deposit uh, uh, legislation, you are financially motivating that behavior and you get an inc uh, increased purity because you have to check the bottle to refund the deposit. But in EPR, many times companies who are making today non-recyclable packaging will pay into EPR schemes uh, and no effect will occur on their packaging, you know, uh, uh, and it won't uh, uh, go into the right uh, right location. And this is important because if we don't do this well, you're going to get uh, counter uh, forces. So, for example, to meet this discrepancy in recycled content uh, demand versus supply, there is already an onslaught of fake recycled content hitting mm. the market. Yeah. And it is very difficult to know. I mean, there are some technologies that can maybe figure out if the batch you got was really recycled or not. Uh, but it's, it's, it's more of an art than a science at best. And that is horrible uh, that then well-meaning brand owners are going to be trying to do the right thing only to be deceived because of the market conditions that are present. And this is the big white elephant in the room. It's yeah. that uh, we have to look at the underlying economics of uh, circularity and subsidize that to, uh, uh, to be more circular and then make the non-circular actions less uh, uh, economically valid and tax them. And that's a great role of legislation to help us get there. And I, uh, I feel like there's so much more of this conversation I really want to have, and I can see people around the table really wanting to contribute. <laughs> However, um, I'm very conscious of time. Sorry. Um, uh, and what I really wanted to do is make sure that we had some actionable steps for people really, uh, really complex subject. You know, what kind of, th what are the key things that we need? What are the things that people can do when they next sit down at the desk? So I'm really looking for something. I'm going to ask everybody on the panel here for one actionable thing. Um, it needs to be tweetable, so it needs to be short and sweet, please. Um, Roland, I'm going to ask yourself, first of all. What, for, for my last statement? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> You're under uh, pressure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm a bit overwhelmed by the question, actually. No, no. Um, uh, my statement is packaging design is, uh, is a profession and companies should take it as uh, more serious as they do now. Couldn't agree more. Very short and sweet. Thank you. Robert? Yeah, I, I have the hope and the ambition that we take you know, this challenge in a factual, science-based and also transparent way. 
Um, we have to prevent that we have parties cherry picking what suits them rather than trying to find you know, the ideal solution from a full life cycle equation. Yeah? Um, and that supports everybody to lean in in that aspect and to understand the full party. Leaning in is absolutely key. I couldn't agree more. Hildegarde. I agree. We should bring the different parties and, 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 and stakeholders together in relation to it. And I think the key starts with uh, language and understanding the key standards. I think there's so much, the lack of transparency is because it's open to interpretation. And if we really want to be scalable, we have to go back to this is the basic understanding, this is what we're going to achieve. And then at least all the different parties coming together, the stakeholders, will be able to get there. <laughs> it's twice as hard when we don't have that clarity up front. Thanks, Hildegarde. Tom? I say this to anyone listening, whether you are a, an individual uh, or, or a stakeholder, and I will preface saying I'm a big hypocrite to this, but I think what I would encourage everyone to do is simply stop buying stuff. <laughs> because in the end, we vote for the future we want with what we buy. And an act of not buying is just as powerful a vote, maybe even more powerful than the act of purchase. <laughs> Love that. Thank you, Tom. And Chris? Oh, well, uh, this is a surprise because I wasn't, uh, I wasn't I prepared I'm, to that. I know, I'm surprised. I'll throw this one at you. I'll, I'll shorten my summary. Well, I think uh, this discussion has shown that, uh, that we have, uh, um, first of all, I, 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 I thought this discussion is a very high-level discussion. We have pinpointed all the, the issues in the subject and the dilemmas which we, which we see in practice. So uh, th therefore, uh, thank you very much for, for all, uh, all of you to, uh, to uh, have this, uh, this, this, this discussion. My, my one-liner one one is, uh, this is my, my, I use these words because then I can think of the one-liner. Please join uh, the, the Pack Forward movement Great to choice. tackle all these dilemmas we mentioned here. Fantastic, Chris. So um, I hope that everybody watching has found this panel debate as amazing and exciting as I have. I'm such a packaging geek and love, I could talk about packaging all day um, for far too long. Thank you everybody for your really valuable content, really appreciate it, um, it's really, really helpful. Um, a couple of key things for me to summarise very bri briefly before I hand you back to the wonderful Chris. Um, population growth and the way that we consume and use resources is not sustainable and it can't continue in the way that it does. We need to change the way that we, we do this. Um, we need to innovate in policy as well, um, considering how we, um, the metrics that we use. The industry, I think, is investing time and money in the wrong track. I think we need to re really rethink about how we, how we approach that. Um, and then finally, I think that for me, a real hope for the Pack Forward movement um, is you know, making sure that we can share knowledge better globally, locally and within businesses, but also globally to especially think about not just the Western world, but, but, de but developing nations and, and, um, who are actually uh, having a lot of the impacts that, that, that we're causing. Um, my closing question really is to ask people whether they want to be part of the problem or part of the solution. Um, I certainly know which legacy I want to leave behind in my footsteps. Chris, I've left a very few more seconds for yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, 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 uh, I couldn't uh, conclude more than your last, your last one-liner from, uh, from that point of view. Uh, I will uh, thank you, uh, Roland, uh, Tom, Robert. Hildegard for this uh, for this uh, fine uh, discussion. Also, Marcia for doing this. Uh, this uh, Marcia isn't here, but she does she did a really big <laughs> job to organise this the last few uh, the last few months. So uh, I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tracy, for chairing this uh, this meeting. It was very professionally done, and I have a special um, uh, 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 presentation for all the viewers and uh, listeners of this webcast. You can get this book for free if you are the first come in. First come in, first serve. We only charge you for the shipping costs, which is in the Netherlands almost nothing, and in Europe also. But if you are living in, let's say, Senegal or Nigeria, you might pay some, some euros for the shipping cost, but you can get it for free if you, are, uh, if you go to the, the website of the KIDV. And, and you can download the PDF as well as You can also download it, but it's, it's, it's classical to have this. You know, it smells <laughs> good. Well, debatable, so, debatable. So, uh, so it's, it's, you can do both. You can, you, know? you okay. absolutely can. Thank you very much. Um, see you again in Pack Forward, and let's Pack Forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.